So I go by Paul, uh, despite what my name tag might say. Um, I am a graduate student in David Separately's lab uh, at UIUC. And so today I want to talk to you about some of the calculations I've done on uh, solid and lithium, uh, uh, solid and liquid lithium, the Compton profile of this uh, material using quantum Monte Carlo and particularly came CPAC. So before I start, I just want to thank my collaborators on the theory side. I work with uh, Marcus Holzman from France, and we also work with a few experimentalists from Japan. Okay, just to start out, uh, I want to define what the Compton profile is for you. Um, so in one sentence, the Compton profile is the radon transform of the electronic momentum distribution along a scattering vector EZ. So uh, I'm showing an example here um, where, uh, so the way we calculate the Compton profile is that we first calculate the three-dimensional momentum distribution, and then you start taking two-dimensional slices along a given direction, let's say the Z direction, like so. And then the interval of each two-dimensional slice gives you one value along this Compton profile. So when you finish your scan, you get a profile that is the Compton profile. Okay. So uh, why do we study the Compton profile at all? Why bother? Um, so I would say that the Compton profile is a measurable signature of exchange interaction. We want to study exchange and correlation in our uh, theory. So uh, it's a nice thing that it's measurable. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So, so I already mentioned the Compton profile is related to the uh, momentum distribution, and the momentum distribution contains uh, signatures of exchange and correlation. So shown on the left here are just some schematics, drawings of uh, simple momentum distribution of simple systems I've taken from this 1972 Bell Labs paper. So the first one is just the momentum distribution of the free Fermi gas. So right off the bat, uh, Fermion exchange results in a jump in the momentum distribution, whereas for a classical system, you have a Boltzmannic, like a Gaussian curve. Uh, so this will result in a cusp point in the Compton profile right at the Fermi momentum. Now next, if you include electron-electron inter electron interaction, then you, smooth, then you reduce the magnitude of this jump, uh, and that will result in the smoothing of, of the cusp point in the Compton profile. Last but not least, if you consider electron ion interaction, in particular, if you put in a crystalline lattice, your electron can scatter off of the crystalline lattice in what's called a uh, Ucom process, processes. They'll bring them up to secondary Fermi uh, surfaces. Uh, so you introduce these secondary uh, discontinuities, which will show up as secondary cusp points in the Compton profile. Here really is that the three dimensional momentum distribution is a many body observable that contains signatures of exchange and interaction. Further, it is a measurable quantity, the Compton profile. So in, in this sense, it bridges experiment and simulation. It's nice to in QMC to calculate something that experiments can measure in, in addition to energy, which is hard. So uh, just kind of an outline of some of the things I want to talk about. So first, I want to talk about the method. And I wouldn't show this to any other audience, but uh, here we want to learn how to do QMC accurately. So I'll show the challenges and like how we were able to go get accurate um, momentum distribution from quantum Monte Carlo. Uh, it turns out the most important thing to get right is the physics, who would have known. Um, but then finite size effects are also very important, and there are algorithm uh, effects that we can take into account. So I'll save the best for the last, uh, but I will first start out with uh, describing the finite size effect, which can be grouped into two conceptual categories. You have uh, independent electron effects, which exist even if you use a, a uncorrelated method. Uh, and there are many body effects that only really occur with QMC and other many body methods. Um, so on the side of algorithm, I use fixed node diffusion Monte Carlo. So you really need to take care of mixed estimator for anything that's not the energy. Um, I really crush, I mean, the wave function is really good, so I crushed the time step error and the Walker error using big computers, so I'm just not going to talk about that. A uh, fixed node error, I haven't gotten the time to investigate, so I won't talk about that in this talk. Okay, so let's start out with um, independent electron finite size effect. So we take care of this by using a twist average grid. Um, so, but in the uh, usual case, you use the so-called canonical twist average grid, where you change the twist angle, but you always simulate the same number of electrons at each twist. Now, that's bad for metal, because um, then you end up with uh, occupation sometimes outside the Fermi surface, 
and sometimes you don't occupy enough states to fill the Fermi surface. So you end up with a with a momentum distribution that's kind of jagged. Uh, and if you plot a one dimensional profile, it is smoothed out a little bit right at the Fermi momentum. And it's important to get property correct right next to the Fermi <coughs> momentum. So uh, that's something you want to avoid. The fix to that is to use the so-called grand canonical twist grid. Uh, this simply, uh, the, this scheme simply says you can change the number of electrons at each twist. And so we can choose the occupation such that there's no occupation outside the Fermi surface, and you get a smooth Fermi surface like so. And the pluses here of the is the spherically average momentum distribution using the grand canonical grid. You can see it is sharper. So this is uh, not currently built into Nexus, but it's not very difficult to achieve. Um, just using the uh, QMC pack input object from Nexus. So what I do is I run Nexus with skip submit, and then it generates the input file. Then you just loop through it, and then uh, read your input file into a QMC pack input object. Then it's easy to edit this object to change the number of electrons in the simulation, and then you just run it. Okay. So uh, that was the independent electron finite size effect. Uh, we also have important many body finite size effects uh, right at the Fermi surface for the uh, momentum distribution. This is described in more detail in this paper and the references therein. Um, but just to show you here, the dash line is the momentum distribution calculated using 54 electrons without any finite size correction. When I apply the finite size correction, you get the solid curve, which you can see deviates from the finite size, uh, finite size result right next to the Fermi surface. Here is the actual correction. It's very large next to the Fermi surface. This is only true for metal. Uh, now you can see it brings the momentum distribution down a little inside the Fermi surface and brings it up outside. So the largest correction is to the magnitude of this jump, which I will call zeta. Um, another important thing one needs to note is that this zeta scales as 1 over L of system size, so 1 over n to the 1 third, rather than 1 over n, like the total energy. So the extrapolation can be quite painful. So I did 54 and 432 to extrapolate to the uh, final value. Um, fortunately, we applied the finite size correction scheme from this paper, and the results are quite good. So uh, the square, the dot, and the pluses are all just different ways to apply, different limits of applying the uh, uh, correction, but they all agree with each other and they all agree with the extrapolated value. So we're pretty happy with our results. One important thing to note in this extrapolation, uh, in this finite size correction, is that they all use uh, the um, uh, static structure factor S of K. So you need to make sure your calculation of S of K is converged uh, well. Um, so fortunately for our calculation, it seems to be the case that the S of K is well converged even with just 54 electrons. So here I'm showing the S of K as a function of K uh, for different system sizes and different configurations of the lithium atoms. Um, you will see that the crosses, which are the 54 electron results, agree really well with the 432 electron results. And further, all of them kind of fall onto this RPA random phase approximation result at, uh, um, at the long wavelength limit or k going to zero limit. So uh, we're confident that our SFK are converged and we can use it to correct for the finite size effects in our system. So just as an example of something I already understand, if I use it to correct the total energy, uh, so the crosses here are the uncorrected value that you extrapolate using one over n for the total energy. And um, the pluses here are the corrected value. And the scale here, is actually this is half of a milli EV per electron. So you can see even with just 54 electron after correction, uh, the uh, final result is well within one milli EV per electron for the total energy. So that's quite good. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned is I also did all electron calculation for the crystal as the uh, stars here, and they agree quite well with the previous all electron calculation using localized orbitals. Um, they also agree very well with RPA, so it's good. So, how is this so good? Uh, well, 
but besides throwing a lot of computer time at it, I, I would think that what I did manually was important. So in particular, you can use the uh, so-called long-range gastro potential to fix the correct long-range behavior of the many-body wave function. Um, so this is implemented in uh, Kim CPAC thanks to Ray. Um, and you just specify it like so. It's a gastro type equals the K space. And you just specify what value you want it to be at a list of K vectors. So uh, this will, so shown on the right here is uh, just DMC, DMC, DMC calculation performed with or without uh, the, the long range gastro. So the crosses, the orange crosses are ones without. You can see that there's a large difference between the VMC result, which is the dash line, and the DMC result, which is the solid line. Whereas if I really optimize the uh, case phase gastro correctly, then I get the green pluses, and the VMC results and the VMC results are basically on top of each other. So there, there are a few really nice things that happens when you do this. Uh, First of all, it reduces variance, so you don't have to run as long to get the same error bar. Uh, it also allows DMC to converge faster, because you can see a lot of the work that DMC is doing is trying to fix up the long-range behavior of the wave function, which you started out being wrong. Uh, this also minimizes the amount of mixed estimate error, because you don't have to do a lot of extrapolation. I should say that you shouldn't worry if you didn't use this, because if you correctly extrapolate, just do a mixed estimate extrapolation, you still recover the correct S of K, whether you use a line range gesture or not. Um, that being said, the re residual error seems to be larger and your error bars are larger. So I trust the screen line more. Okay. Um, this feature, so the way I did this is I spent a lot of effort optimizing this case based gastro for one disorder configuration at one single twist. And then with Nexus, you can read it into a QMC pack input, extract out the optimized wave function that I manually tweaked, and then you just shove it into any sort of uh, new calculation you want to do and simply use it. So this short circuits the uh, QMC pack optimization part, which could introduce noise. Um, and because I'm just changing the twist and changing the configuration slightly, the optimized gastro is good enough for all of those calculations. So this is a nice way to just go without introducing extra work. Um, so what I said, I will introduce the best thing for the last. So this is actually uh, the effect of physics. Um, we try to compare our calculated Compton profile with the experiment and see how well we do. Okay, so here's the Compton profile, and the black line is the experimental result of a polycrystalline crystal at room temperature. If you just take the Kohn-Sham determinant wave function and calculate Compton profile, you end up with the free electron-like inverse parabola thing, which makes sense because this wave function does not include any electron correlation. Now, after you run Quantum Monte Carlo with a pseudo-potential, you get the dash line here, which agrees much better with the experiment, but is still not satisfactory. In particular, you get the wrong asymptotic behavior, and there's a large discrepancy at low momentum, just because of the sum rule. Now, what happens if you do an all-electron calculation, which is shown as the green line here, is that you fix up this, long, long, uh, this uh, large K behavior, and you also agree much better with the experiment down here. So this is rather easy to understand, um, just from the construction of the pseudo potential, because when we, what we do when we construct a pseudo potential is that we take a valence orbital, shown as the black line here, that has this wiggle. We smooth it out to construct the pseudoized wave function and the pseudo potential. So of course, because you're throwing out this wiggle, you're throwing out uh, some uh, large K behavior or short range, you're throwing out the short range feature of uh, the compound profile. So you really need uh, to use an all electron calculation or do some sort of correction to try to match the experiment. In, indeed, if I just consider the difference, the, the effect of this difference from constructing it for an atom, I consider that effect uh, on the Compton profile, I get the stash blue line. And if I compare that to what I get when I switch from a pseudo potential to a all electron calculation in QMC, I get this green line and they basically match up already. Okay, so 
that was kind of the methodological details of what I, what we did and how we we're matching experiments. But our experimental colleagues asked, uh, why is this helpful to, to us? So, so here are two ways that I think our calculation has been, been able to help their data analysis. So firstly, we were able to disentangle the effect when they, they look at the Compton profile as a solid versus a liquid. Um, the second thing we were able to do is calculate the magnitude of this jump, which, which is really hard to get from their experimental data alone. So I will go into more detail here. Um, so uh, shown here is the change to the Compton profile when the liquid freezes into a solid. Now what happens is that the solid is denser than the liquid, so the Fermi surface must push out a little bit, right? So when the Fermi surface push out, you can see the um, Compton, uh, the Compton profile will just push out a little bit with a peak right at the Fermi surface. We can reproduce this effect simply by rescaling the liquid Fermi uh, surface uh, by the density that they measure in the experiment. Uh, and this is by far the largest effect that they see. Now, of course, there's some residual. You can kind of see the, the green line doesn't fall exactly on top of uh, the blue line. There's some deviation. You, you, when you plot that deviation, uh, first of all, it is an order of magnitude smaller than the density effect. And second, we can see this in our QMC data. So if I take the difference between my solid and liquid in my QMC data at the same density, so just ignore the density effect, then you see that when you freeze into a solid, you create this crystal lattice, and that gives you these secondary Fermi surfaces uh, centered around the reciprocal lattice vectors. And the main effect of, of this, uh, the formation of the crystal lattice, is simply to shift some of the weight from the main Fermi surface to the secondary Fermi surface. So we were able to disentangle this using our data, which they couldn't uh, really do in the experiment. I guess they could this harder. The second thing we were able to do is to extract the magnitude of the discontinuity in the momentum distribution. So this is very difficult from the clinical data alone because to go from the Compton profile to the momentum distribution, you have to take a derivative of noisy measurement data. And so this is what they get, uh, whereas we can just see it. Uh, the second thing is that there are a number of experimental effects, artifacts and stuff <coughs> that will reduce, they will smooth, smooth out their Compton profile right at the Fermi surface, so they really can't see this very well. Whereas for us, it's easy because we just take one disorder realization, we look in one direction, there's no spherical, there's no directional averaging, there's no disorder averaging, then we can clearly see this jump, we can get it out, and then uh, histogram it for all the disorder realizations and take an average. So this is what happens. Um, so here I am showing the uh, Fermi momentum, the magnitude of the jump, and the momentum distribution right before and after the jump. So these uh, these things are shown on the right figure here. Um, so the color encodes what direction you're looking, and the first row is solid, the second row is liquid, and uh, these lines next to the solid results are the uh, perfect crystal results. So uh, first of all, you see that uh, when you when you allow the uh, you, when you introduce disorder into your lattice, it makes the makes the crystal a little bit more like the liquid. So the Fermi surface becomes more spherical, and the magnitude of the uh, jump decreases a little bit. And second of all, the liquid Fermi surface is completely isotropic, whereas the fairly, uh, solid Fermi surface is clearly not. And here we can also see that the reason the solid uh, jump is so small along the 110 direction is because that uh, the momentum distribution is really low uh, within the Fermi surface. And I think this is because the uh, because this is a the, the reciprocal lattice vectors are along the 110 direction, so this is because you get those the secondary peaks along 110, so you have to shift more weight out of your main Fermi surface, so we can understand all of these. So basically, in conclusion, uh, we were able to perform accurate quantum and Carlo simulations, and our all-election result agree very well with the experiment away from the Fermi surface. 
um, we were able to help them disentangle the effect of uh, density and crystal formation uh, in the change of their Compton profile from the liquid to the solid, and we were able to help them extract the magnitude of the discontinuity in the Compton profile. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to thank you uh, for your attention. I would like to thank the QMC pack developers for making this code, uh, thoroughly testing this code and making the science much easier, and uh, I would like to ask if there's any questions. Much. Good luck. So, uh, what do you think is the, still the remaining difference on the Compton profile? Is it temperature or? Yeah, so that is a great question. Uh, we have a lot of hypotheses and we haven't really confirmed uh, much of them. So, temperature is something that uh, we haven't really been able to explore, but at least we know that there is a final state effect, which definitely plays a role. And then we know that because we use the Slater Jasper wave function, if we switch to backflow, our thing goes up a little bit. So mm -hmm. uh, if, yeah, when they, when they take care of the final state effect, their thing goes down a little bit. So mm -hmm. whatever is within the final difference, there are so many things that could be. Oh, so I really am not sure. And the, because on lithium, maybe even zero point motion could, could add something. I don't know. That is true. That is true. We try to take care of that by taking these disorder samples, but of oh, course we're make, missing some of the phonon effects. Super. There was a question back in the middle. Okay, yeah, go ahead at the back. I think it was Ray before, but oh, yeah. it's given up. Oh, my, my, my question was, uh, when you add this K-space Jastro, did you have a feeling how much slowdown the code is? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so the question is, how much slowdown does the K-space Jastro cause? Now, that depends on how many K-shells I include. Um, so for my testing, I believe it's something like 20% for six K shells that I put in. But uh, because you get reduced variance and you get faster DMC convergence, it kind of balances it out a little bit. When you do the grand canonical ensemble to smooth out the Fermi surface back to the physical shape, how much charge have you put in percentage? One percent is... Yeah, that is a great question. Uh, so the question is, how much charge am I putting into the grand canonical calculation at certain twists? So right next to the Fermi surface, this could be up to, um, I'm trying to think, six electrons out of 54, which is a significant amount. That's a lot. Yeah. That's almost 10%. Um, right, almost 10%. Um, but the idea is that you have the balancing charge from one side of the twist to the other. So overall, so the average number of particles is 54 when they average overall twists. So the background is more like a, a bookkeeping exercise to make sure everything works. Right. So for the grand canonical twist averaging, um, how are you figuring out the electron <coughs> on the number of electrons, like do you take the Fermi surface from the mean field theory or do you do something in post-processing? So yeah, that is a great question. The question is how do I decide the number of electrons to put at each twist? Uh, so what I did is exactly what you, what you said. I take the mean field results. So basically I look at the quotient eigenvalues at the twist I'm interested. I look at the Fermi energy and just count how many states are below the Fermi energy. Now, of course, the correct thing to do would be to do QMC calculations at plus one, plus two, plus three, <coughs> minus one, minus two, minus three, and look at, use that to decide uh, where you want to put the atom. But that's too expensive, and for uh, lithium, it seems to, it seems like our thing is fun. Any more? All right, well, thanks so much.